Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the North Gymnasium. I'm Lucas Corley alongside Dr. John Shalosky as we get you set for Whiteland Wrestling. And Dr. Shalosky, it's been uh, a very interesting year across all sports here in the school district, but perhaps known that none that is more affected than wrestling when you look at what COVID does to a lineup and, of course, forfeitures and how that affects the points, it's completely different than anything else. And tonight, Whiteland taking on Mooresville. There are a couple forfeitures. We'll get to that later. But it's been a weird season across all sports, but perhaps none more so than wrestling. I've been ecstatic that we've been able to have the opportunity to have some sort of a season. And uh, this is one of the more difficult sports to continue along with. However, this is also one sport that is used to having to be very sanitary, uh, watching what you're doing with distancing and all of that. And that's been going on all along. Let's go ahead and take a look here at our uh, matchups. At the 106 weight class, it'll be Mooresville. It'll have Tyler Miller, a forfeiture for Whiteland at 113. Griffin Sanders for Mooresville. Joey Butler for Whiteland. 120, Aiden O'Brien for Mooresville. Eli Brooks for Whiteland. 126, Isaiah Pugh for Mooresville. And for Whiteland, Jaden Wiseman. At 132, Gavin Gott for Mooresville. Caden Ballman, a captain today, uh, one of the three seniors that will be uh, taking on that captain role uh, for Whiteland. And then for 138, Kenny Curry for Mooresville. Ryan Williams for the Warriors. 145, Alex Moore for the Pioneers. Yash Dillon coming in for Whiteland. Uh, originally had scheduled a forfeiture there, but they bring in Yash to take over that weight class. 152, Michael Stoddard for Mooresville. Blake Driver for Whiteland. Carter Howard for Mooresville. And... Uh, Gilbert Tinoco for Whiteland at the 160 weight class. 170, it'll be Mooresville's Dylan Pierce. Vincent Tinoco for Whiteland. 182, Luke Bullock for Pioneers. And Aaron Picchetti for Whiteland. At 195, Trevin Babb for Mooresville. And Braden Ninnis for Whiteland. And our final two weight classes at 220, Dakota Sanders for Mooresville. Jakari Oliver for Whiteland. And at 285, Davis Hall for Mooresville. And for Whiteland, Connor Davis. And as I was mentioning, uh, John, it, it is very interesting to see really even this many full spots, full weight classes, only one forfeiture then on the part of Whiteland. But it does put you behind uh, some quick points, and that's something that they'll have to be aware of. Uh, and, and kind of the way they strategize it. And talk about how that does change the way you strategize. Yeah, because sometimes what you'll end up doing is is trying to eke out additional points in order to move a decision to a uh, major decision or a major decision to a tech fall or even how much more effort you're going to go towards a pin to equalize that point deficit. We'll be starting at 132 pounds this evening, and it does look like uh, the Pioneers have a little bit more uh, maturity in that lineup, but there's an awful lot of talent on the Warrior side. And I'm not sure, did they say here before the match which weight class we will be starting on? I know that not always do. They start at 106, the lowest one, but it looks like here 132 is where we'll start and work our way down and then back up. So that'll be Gavin Gott for Mooresville, and then he'll be taking on Caden Ballman, the senior captain for the Whiteland Warriors. So we start there, and uh, Pleasure to have you here with me, John. It's our first Whiteland Warriors wrestling broadcast, I believe of all time is what I've been told. So, you know, doing some new things here as we get started and we're underway. First period. They're right now feeling each other out, and uh, Caden's got that underhook that he let go. Ballman, one of three seniors that was honored before tonight's match. The other two will have Ryan Williams, who actually comes up in 138. And a little bit later, Gilbert Tinoco at 160. Daniel Miller, our official for this evening's contest. We got started a little bit late, of course. Oh, big headlock there right off the bat. So quick two points for the Warriors. Or excuse me, uh, four, uh, three points, I should say. He's got a lot of pressure on that headlock. He's got good technique right here, too. Well, if you're looking to establish some momentum early, this is the way to do it. Real nice headlock. Well, especially since you know that that uh, six points is looming in your lineup. This really tires out the... And there's the pin there. And that's big, like you said, making up those points early. So quick six for Whiteland. And now we go to the 138 matchup. We'll have... The sophomore, Kenny Curry, facing off against Whiteland's Ryan Williams. As mentioned, a senior captain, all three of the seniors' captains this evening. 
Starting off at 132 pounds really did kind of play into the strategy of the Warriors this evening because that is a, a really strong part of their lineup. Daniel Mikesell for Morrisville, the head coach. Anthony Meister for Whiteland. One thing I love about wrestling, especially when you're down here near the floor, you can hear it is a very active coaching sport, always instructions being barked out. And, of course, it's up to the individual on the mat to make the decisions, but a lot of input from the coaches. You know, a lot of times I also wondered how many uh, of my wrestlers actually heard or, or listened to exactly. anything I said. I'm sure that's not just a unique to wrestling. We had a basketball game last night, and there was a maybe – ill-advised three late in the game from one of our players and coach king and he had his heads on his hands he was shouting no from the sideline so it's it must be just a, a coach player type of relationship most of my uh, better coaching was in that brief time uh between periods uh that's when i knew that they were listening absolutely and i think that's the time when after especially after the first period when you've had a chance to fill things out, you can really start to see, okay, what are they? What is their strategy? What are they trying to do? And then make those adjustments. That was a good throw-by technique by Mooresville. He's got the short leg in. Working to control. We need to be careful here and using some technique to, to get back to our belly. Got him in near fall criteria. Uh, Going to give him three points, it looks like, on the near fall. He's holding this, the referee, Danny Miller, holding the three out. That three will stand no matter uh, what transpires here, even through a reversal. Sixteen seconds left here in the first period. And there's the fall. It was a good fight, but um, the Mooresville opponent kept bettering his position in that um, pin sequence. And as we mentioned, of course, that 106 weight class, there will be a forfeiture, but here through the first two matches, all even up at six apiece. And, you know, if this continues to be back and forth, that could be a big forfeiture, but still a lot of wrestling left to do as it's Yash Dillon, the junior against Alex Moore for Mooresville. Warriors in the black and silver with Mooresville and the blue, or excuse me, the yellow with the navy blue stripes. I haven't seen Yash wrestle before, but he's got some really good balance. Kind of lanky. Tell us a little bit about when you, as you work your way up the weight classes, what, how the style starts to differ and kind of what weight class do you start to see that style change? Well, you know, your lighter weights going all the way up to probably 132 or 138 pounds, there's a lot of technique and a lot of speed that goes on there, constant movement. Uh, whereas whenever you move into those middle weights, uh, you are talking that there, there are some differences because uh, you've got some power differences between opponents. And then uh, whenever you get up to the heavier weights, um, there's less movement, more strategy, and concentration on different techniques because especially some of the big boys, I mean, they can't fly around oh, like no. the 106-pounders. <laughs> no, Conditioning especially not quite as good, I would say, on the, on the heavier weights as it is on, like you said, those – uh, smaller sprite wrestlers as we have about 33 seconds left. Uh, deep single leg. And they're going to give two there to Moore. He was smart to get that hand off his head. 24 seconds left here in the first period, and that's just the first scoring of the of the match. Decent little crowd here, I would have to say. The last one we played against, or wrestled against, I guess it was, I believe Decatur Central may have been that I, I was here last. Um, not, not too many people out here. Uh, we've got a uh, stalling call. That's his first, so. Just the warning. That's correct. Uh, we've got to be working to open up or better ourselves, better our position. And that's the end of the first period. Whiteland's choice here. I'll choose up. And tell me also, uh, for those that may not be aware, so I'm not aware, as I mentioned, I'm not necessarily uh, as in, in touch with the strategy. What 
what makes the wrestler or the coach decide whether to go up or down to start off that second period? Well, uh, in the second period, you've got three choices, top, down, neutral, or defer. And a lot of it depends on what your strengths are, what you're seeing from that first period. Uh, Especially if I've got somebody who has, uh, my opponent is taking me down and letting me up, I can honestly say I am not going to defer and I am not going to go neutral. So now the question is, do I go bottom or top? So there's a lot of strategy to it, and it'll be based on that first period. Also, you'll see a change in that strategy if it's an opponent that we've seen before or scouted. Moore get, gets the point for the escape just moments ago. Again, 6-6 our match score. And there's Moore that is trying for the takedown here. And they will give it to him. Again, Yash is throwing some uh, really good balance. Just looks like he's missing some technique. This is a junior versus junior matchup, so they'll both have another year on their respective programs. Yash made an error there by turning into the pin. And Mooresville with another pin. That's their second of the evening and their second straight. Now leading 12 to 6 overall, and that brings up our 152 weight class, which that'll be Michael Stoddard, one of the senior captains for Mooresville, and he'll be taking on the sophomore Blake Driver for Whiteland. I think that one of the things you saw, both Yash and Moore were working really hard out there. I think that there was probably just an experience difference. So Driver here at 152, we just saw... Dylan, a little bit taller of a wrestler. Driver. Flurry there on the takedown. Both men back on the feet. This one definitely starting off a little bit faster. Here's where that technique change comes in that you were talking about. I'm impressed with Driver's initiative. Really going after him here. 117 left here in the first period. Oh, try to go for the takedown, but it's going to backfire on him as it's Stoddard that ends up getting it instead. Looked like he went for that leg and instead got himself a little off balance. I think Stoddard was setting up for a counter by the way he was uh, trying to grapple the upper body. may be able to hear the Whiteland chatter from their bench. Not only is it coaches that are involved over there on the bench, but the players, or excuse me, the wrestlers, also very, very involved in the way that they root on and also just seem to get in the ear of the wrestler on the mat. Stoddard using a spiral ride. Bring it back to the center of the mat here with 23 seconds left in the first period. Still just two to nothing. What do you think Driver ought to try here? I'd I'd imagine he's with 23 seconds. He's just going to try to break out and get an escape to get that quick point. He will be on the bottom, so to start the... Well, no, they wouldn't necessarily. That was the last last match. But if he chose the down position in the second one, he could get another escape and be right back in it. And so he gets the first point there, and now he's just kind of ride it out. Inside trip attempt. Onto a stalled single. Another two. Yep. Nice trip on that. Ended up getting near fall. Is he at three or two? Three. He got the five-second criteria. So it'll be 7-1 as we go into the second period. And you could hear the, the Mooresville fans that were here so close to maybe getting the pin right there at the end, but he will still get the three points. Stoddard had a really good combination off that single leg. So it will be driver down here to start the second. We're at seven to one right now in favor of Stoddard. It seems that Driver's been aggressive as you mentioned, but Stoddard maybe a little bit better on technique. Stoddard also appears to have a little strength advantage, and he leverages that very well. From the conditioning aspect. Obviously, these wrestlers are all in the same, you know, general, they're in the weight class for a reason. 
But what do you, do you do as a wrestler to build strength without necessarily putting yourself up a weight class that you don't necessarily want to be wrestling at? Well, one of the things that you're looking at is is that the strength training in wrestling is a little different than other sports in that uh, you do a lot of more pull exercises because a lot of the things that you're doing in wrestling the majority of the time are pull whereas in football it's push right and so um a lot of it has to do with diet though just pure and simple if you're looking to bulk up you will stoddard got the three points for the near fall Ten one, forty eight seconds left here in the second period. You know, you mentioned diet. I had a former teacher of mine that was a wrestling coach. He said that right before weigh-ins, they would go into the visitors' locker room and they would put a box of donuts. And if there'd be some wrestlers <laughs> that would be so tempted, they'd be you know cutting weight all week that they they'd break down and eat before the weigh-in. And the rest of them, they were hoping that they would get out of the way and come back and chow down on some of those donuts. And the sugar rush would make them a little sick. As you know, talk about some dirty tricks, but. Thought that was just a, a fun little story that just goes to show that it's, it's it's half a mental game too when it comes to the dieting as well for these wrestlers. And it really is. And you know, uh, the ones who have the best diets a lot of times have the most success at maintaining their their weight uh, because there is no shortcutting it. Um, there are some unhealthy ways to make weight, and those are things that we don't want the kids doing. Well, no, too, especially like you said, if you're trying to cut a lot of weight very quickly, you're probably not going to have much energy when it comes time to put your performance on the mat. And especially to go for a full six minutes as hard as you can. Into the second period. Score sitting at 10-1. to This will be our first match that will go the full three periods. I think Driver's doing a really nice job of trying to keep himself out of jeopardy positions, uh, whereas uh, Stoddard really is uh, pushing to try to get him to open up. Stoddard will be down here to start the third. Stoddard looking, and he gets the quick reversal. Blake was just a little slow in reacting to that switch. And you mentioned, too, just the technique. Wrestling is so much a full-body sport. You have to be good with the hands. You have to be good with your balance down low. You know, You've got to keep your head up at times to see what your opponent's doing. There's there's so much and and so many different ways to get the job done, but you got to find your style, and you have to also play to your opponent's style at, at times as well. you got to be aware, and because you may be pushing or pulling on my upper body when in reality you're wanting to get at my legs. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times you can get baited or tricked into doing exactly the move that the offensive wrestler's wanting to do. You'll see them a lot of times they'll bait their arm over and in front of the face. Well, because one of the things you teach is to grab that arm. But if I'm good with a cradle, I want you to grab that because I'm going to be coming right back up through the leg and locking my hands and tipping you back. You think they're playing checkers and they end up playing chess. That's well put. 41 seconds left to go here in the final period of this and there will be an escape there for Driver, the 152 weight class. And now going for the takedown, does not get it. But I like that he's still fighting, especially this late in the match. Well, too, you're trying to get yourself out of that major decision category. Right now it's sitting there at 10. It would be a major decision for Stoddard. We've had a pin in the first three matches of the evening. Eight seconds left. Driver just trying to keep from being one of those pins. And it looks like unless there's something late here, that will end the 152 weight class, and it will be a major decision and four points there for Mooresville. Even though the score was 12-2, to it doesn't uh, really indicate how tough that match really was because that is a gritty senior captain in Stoddard and Driver uh, hung with him toe to toe. I'll make it 16 to 6 in favor of Mooresville on the overall team match score. We go to 
Gilbert Tinoco, another captain, another senior. The, lo the last senior, or rather we do have, no, that's, this is our last senior of the evening for Whiteland against Carter Howard, the junior for Mooresville. We've got Gilbert Tinoco right now, and then we'll have Vincent in the 170 weight class to follow. Vincent, the sophomore brother. Wanted to see who's going to get the advantage of the hand fight. Here's where you start, as you mentioned, You're starting to see the stylistic changes. You get more into just kind of that strength category, not so much the speed. A lot of hand fighting here earlier. As you get to the heavier weights, the setups for the takedown are a lot simpler but more direct because you can rely on that power. That was a good double leg there, escape. So Howard with the takedown, Tonoko with the quick escape. How important, too, is it, John, if you're a team? Uh, wrestling, to me, is a lot like tennis in a way in the sense of the scoring. You play as an individual. Beautiful takedown. See if he can capitalize. He's got him on his back. Definitely felt him out on that takedown. Is he going to get the three here? He's the in a good position. Count was close. He's looking at the official. Chest down, head up. Very close. A lot of pressure. Almost there. And oh, there it is. Him. Great match there by Tinoco. Gilbert did a super job with that takedown, opened him up, and had the awareness to go straight for the half Nelson. I'll finish the point I was going to make. I was going to say a lot like tennis in the sense that you play as an individual, you can get yourself a win, but you want your team to win as well. It's sometimes tough, I would say, to not scoreboard watch and say, do I need to make a big move here for the team, or do I? how do I play as an individual, how do I wrestle as an individual? And a lot of that's the culture that you build around your program. Um, you can have a program that is centered on some very strong individuals, and then you can have that team mentality. Uh, one of the things that happens in these matches, and like I said, starting at 132 plays in the favor of the Warriors because um, you get that momentum going. And that's what you're looking for. Oh, nice throw attempt. Just ran out of real estate. And this is, just interject here for a second, the 170 weight class with Dylan Pierce, a freshman from Mooresville, the sophomore, Vincent Tinoco. And you look up and down the lineups, and Whiteland is a very young team for the most part. Let's see if he goes back to that pancake again for the throw. I'm not sure that this is the position that Pierce wants to be in after the smoothness of that one that went out of bounds. Maybe we'll see there. Tinoco's got the hand on the hip, the takedown, and they'll say off again. I like the way he's fighting, though. Tinoco tried to turn that into an inside trip, which is a common move off of that over-under hook. feel like these two have kind of felt each other out a little bit here to start. 54 seconds left in the first period, and still no one has yet, no, or no one has scored, although the Tinoco's had a couple shots. He's definitely been the aggressor so far on the feet. Going for the trip. Trips to the back. Gets the takedown. Good shot on the double leg. Needs to secure the arm. Potentially look for a reverse half. It's a good position to be in. Can't tell there if our official Daniel Miller has given him the three. Looks like he had it. He won't assign it until the pin threat is, is over. Trying to come back with a Peterson. Doesn't have it yet. They do give him the yeah. reversal, so there will be three for Tinoco and two for Pierce. We'll see what we got here. Uh, this will be interesting. So we had the three and the two, and he's called for a technical violation. Do 
Okay, we got a point on a technical violation. It looks like he may be calling, uh, grabbing the headgear. Yes, so the opponent was trying to gain an advantage by utilizing the headgear as leverage. But he, I, did he say there was two technical violations? Because our score is now 6-4, unless they're saying the reversal is probably the two there for uh, Pierce for Mooresville. So that gets us at 6-4 and heads us into the second period. Great match here, though, at 170. As you mentioned, Gilbert's been the aggressor. Pierce has Or rather, I should say Vincent Tinoco. Pierce has some good counters, and he knows what to do with them, but I think that Tinoco's thrown a couple of different looks at him. I feel like when you're in that position defensively, it's so hard to keep your balance when he's got his hands around the back of your neck. You're leaned forward. Well, you do a lot of uh, work in your stance. Uh, and so you've got to practice that stance. Uh, it looks natural to the kids, but if you'll notice, everyone has slight variations on it because some of it's also comfort. But as a head coach, sometimes you have to tell your wrestler, don't use that stance. You're making yourself prone or, or open in some way. I hate to make another analogy, but like baseball, you have a batting stance. You'll have coaches that will say, I know you're comfortable, but that is not going to get you a lot of hits. Yeah, it's it's that uh, awareness, the, the the physical awareness of your body and balance. Stoddard, we saw earlier, get the last win for Mooresville. He was wrestling up a class this year, one of the senior captains. Now two matches later, 170, Dylan Pierce, a freshman. And again, this is where you bring in these young wrestlers and uh, sometimes you have a chance to make an immediate impact. As Tinoco. Another double leg. With a takedown. Now 8-4. Got him off balance with about 20 seconds left here in the second period. He sees an opening on that double leg. Uh, and he's seeing something. And it looks like a hitch in uh, Pierce's stance. So Tinoco is able to anticipate something. And he's shooting through that. Because those have been powerful double legs. So that ends our second period. We go to the third. Oh, wow, and there you hear some disagreement between Pierce and his coach, Daniel Mike. So he wanted to go neutral. Coach telling him to go down, get the escape. I think coach is right right here, uh, especially since there's been some success down. We've got a position caution. And Pierce is probably thinking to himself, Pierce is probably thinking to himself that. Cut him loose. Tried to trap him. There, they get the escape. I was going to say, Pierce is probably thinking to himself, I need to get a takedown AS ASAP. Not so much worried about the escape, but the escape is a quick and easy point that you can get. That's your difference right there. You're talking about a three-point difference if Pierce can get a takedown. That's why I said uh, Coach Mikesell was right on the money in telling him, yeah, you need to go down. I'm sure the disagreement will be a discussion they'll have after this match as well. Like you said, you have those conversations. Not always does the wrestler want to listen. Well, good wrestlers already have mapped out in their mind how the entire match is going to go. And so you develop your own strategy, and but sometimes you fail to tell the coach. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they would like to be in on that, wouldn't they? Typically, you don't want your coach to be the last one to find out what's going to happen. I know that Tinoco's wanting to secure this win. I hope that he's looking for one more score just so he's not in a position where it's a one move. And there was a nice duck under to a double leg, and he got one more score. He saw the opportunity, and he took it. Sometimes you worry about, can you get too aggressive in a match? But right there, Vincent Tinoco, just excellent patience. And now ahead 10-5, looking to just ride out these final 42 seconds from the third. Although 
up five. If he can get three more points here, he goes from a decision to a major decision, which gets you that extra point for the team score as well and would tie this match up. Uh, what you were saying about being aggressive uh, and, and when to not be aggressive is really important. Uh, in the year 2000, Whiteland had a state heavyweight champion named uh, Jason Fryer, and Jason was actually down in the championship match uh, to a kid named Wagner from Fort Wayne Schneider, and Wagner never knew the word quit. And he kept coming forward, and Fryer hit him with a last-minute move, which changed the tide by three points, and he was the state heavyweight champion. I think that's what separates any great athlete from a good athlete, not knowing the word quit. You look at Quentin Gillespie, what he did in tennis this year. Now, he had to pull out because of uh, just severe cramping, but yes. he went until he could no, literally could physically no longer go. And that's what you love to see out of our Whiteland Warriors. Yeah, and the funny thing of it is, is the next year, uh, Wagner from Schneider was the state champion. And I remember uh, Coach um, Thompson, who was the head coach of the Warriors, went up to his coach and said, why didn't you tank that last 15 seconds? And that's what was said. Uh, Wagner never quit. A lot of score there, well, on the scoreboard, showing 12-6, which I believe would that not just be a three-point decision? That should have been a three-point decision. Well, we got 16 all showing on our scoreboard here. We'll get a clarification on that. We're looking here at the 182 weight class. Get it all set up here. And our 182 Gotta weight get class. that head up. Luke Bullock for Mooresville and Aaron Piketty, the freshman for the Whiteland Warriors. Bullock trying to set up a uh, cradle, gives it up, but takes the two points for the takedown. Warriors are still down by one in team store. I so said we got that scoreboard there corrected. And now it looks like Piketty's got some work to do in a headlock here. And that's going to be a pin for Luke Bullock. That was pretty solid. Bullock's a, a stocky kid. A lot of arms there. So 22-15 now. That was a quick one. And we go to 195, Trevin Babb, the senior for Mooresville. And he'll be taking on out of Whiteland, Braden Ninnis. It's awful tough a lot of times for these freshmen to be coming in and be taking on a senior. I was because, about to say, with that experience difference, it has to be tough. Well, and you've also got the physical difference. I mean, uh, there's a lot of difference between a 14-year-old a and an 18-year-old. Well, yeah, four, year, four more years of school lunches. <laughs> exactly. And it's, nice job staying on his feet there. Okay, there was a fake there. See how Bab was going to react. Looks like the headgear might be a little bit loose there. Here's where you begin seeing uh, the wrestlers who will work in a flurry and then they'll stop, size each other out, and catch a quick breather. Still no points scored here. 44 seconds left in the first period. I believe it was, again, that Decatur Central, that in the 285 weight class, we had two periods without any scoring, and I think the first point was scored with about 44 seconds left in the third. And you talk about really feeling each other out during a match. They're taking, they were taking their sweet time in that one. Well, and a lot of times there are different strategies. Um, you've got scorers, you've got pinners, and you've got people that are called grinders. A grinder wants to keep the score low. And the reason is they want to make one move at the end. Uh, scorers 
they want to run up the score. I want to get a big spread to make up for any mistakes. I think you're going to see probably, a, I'd say if Ninnis is going to try any of those styles, it would probably be a grinded out style here, see if he can't get something late in the match. Yeah, because you want to be setting yourself up, especially if you're equally matched. That's the amazing thing about uh, the coaching staff over there for the Warriors. You've got a scorer uh, in uh, Coach White. Uh, you've got a pinner in Coach Cooper, and you have a grinder in Coach Meister. So they can teach each of those techniques. Interesting to see they start the second in the neutral position. Don't see that too often, I wouldn't say. Both coach really being an aggressor here. I do believe that uh, uh, Nennis is going to pick up more confidence as this match goes on. Good job there, Nennis, by stopping the move. Bab had him around the leg looking for that takedown. If you're just joining us, five of our seven matches so far this evening have been decided by a pin. The only two that weren't, Michael Stoddard with a 12-2 win over Blake Driver for Mooresville. And then... Nice drag by, but Nennis is working. He's got he's to fight out and look away. Turn your head and look away. Full Nelson call, that's a... One point penalty against Mooresville. So 3 1 our score. I was saying Tonoco, Vincent Tonoco, the other one, a decision 12 6 over Dylan Pierce just in our last weight class at 170. This is, or rather, two weight classes ago. This is 195 here, Bab and Ninnis for Whiteland. This is something that you were talking about earlier about the team side. Sometimes you'll figure out. I may not be able to actually win this match, but I've got to keep the scoring as low as I can to keep the team in it. 46 seconds left in here, here in period number two. Going for a turk on the ankle. Bab working off to the side. Looked like he was trying to go for a hammer lock. 13 seconds left. Coach Mike Sell for Mooresville right up there on the mat too, giving out instruction. He's not in a position for a cradle there but he was going to try to lock it up, and that'll bring us to the end of the second. All right, so to the third we go. It seems in this match that Bab has controlled it pretty well, but Nina's still right there and starting down here. He's going to have a chance to get an escape, get right back within one. Be even better if he could get a reversal here. Not likely, though. He's got to keep his base, though. He can't be wrestling from his stomach. Bab has that half in again. You've got to turn away and look away. Exerting a lot of energy, too. Did a nice job of fighting that off. He's got the headgear. Sinks the half again. Once again, one of the things that we've got to do is we've got to build that base and not be wrestling from our stomach. And there's the pin. Yeah, like you said, once he had him on his stomach, able to do some pretty good work from there. So it is Bab who gets the fourth pin of the match for Mooresville. Yep. The only real mistake that uh, Ninnis made there, which is just a youthful mistake, is you can't turn into the pin. And he did that there towards the end, yeah. Yeah. Going, going towards his back, to his back. 
Here's the one I had circled, 220, Dakota Sanders, the senior versus Jakari Oliver, the sophomore. But don't let that sophomore uh, class really tell you much about Jakari. He had a pretty good season last year. Fell 6-4 in the 220 in last year's sectional, but won by a pin in his first match. Pretty impressive for the freshman, and now a sophomore. A lot of speed. Of course, one of our football players as well on the sectional title winning team from this past fall. Look at him being the aggressor here. But he's... You could definitely tell that uh, Sanders was uh, trying Ooh, to anticipate nice what Jakari would do. Wow. That is what you call quickness. Just a lot of speed right there. Front trip. First period, one minute still left. Oliver up four to one over Sanders. Sanders tried the same move that he did a moment ago whenever he was able to get Jakari off balance. Oliver trying everything he can do to keep him from crawling outside that ring. Well, it looks like Sanders may have hurt himself there, though. Looks like he hit his head uh, whenever he went forward. I want to show this replay quick here of Oliver on that little duck and dive move. Boom, just like Oh, that, that was really nice. He anticipated that uh, Sanders was going to overextend, and he did. This is wrestling, but that almost looks more like a boxing dodge there a little bit. 31 seconds left here in period number one. Oliver still working hard. He's been in control, it seems, this entire first period. Oliver keeps trying some sort of a Gramby off of that uh, off of that arm bar. It was almost successful the one time, so but I think Jakari has uh, adjusted well to that potential threat. Nice job not giving up the last second point. Oliver is going to start down here, and it looks like Sanders is, well, first of all, he's bobbing around a little bit, and that's going to bring up the trainer. If he hit his head, they may be worried that. Trainer called that one. Yeah, when he came back up to the mat, he was kind of weaving a little bit there. And I saw that too. Be too careful, and you don't know if it's a little fatigue or, you know, but of course the way he went down, you want to be better safe than sorry. Well, and that's one of those things that uh, a wrestling match, uh, we've got to remember that safety is always first. Well, absolutely, and you, we talk about not quitting, but as you said, safety first. And Of course, we'd like to thank Community Health, who does provide the athletic training here, and they give them the thumbs up and say that we'll be able to continue here. If anything, too, that does give Sanders a second to catch his breath. Oliver was working him pretty hard there. And that, again, comes back to what we talked about earlier in the broadcast. Conditioning is perhaps the name of the game when it comes to wrestling. Conditioning, technique. Jakari is always active and always thinking about what his next move is. Gets another two there. Trying to roll the wrist under. You mentioned always moving. Does it surprise you to see someone in the 220 weight class that is as active as Jakari is? It seems like you said like he's always moving. Well, and that's one of the things that I told you. Uh, sometimes those type of wrestlers are an oddity in the upper weights because it takes so much because not only am I initiating something, but I have a big, powerful man stopping me, countering me. And so it becomes very taxing.
He's trying to stretch him out because he knows that he can run around uh, Sanders because Sanders isn't as quick as Jakari. 6-2 with 49 seconds left to go here in the second period. each other out here later in the second period after a flurry of action in the first. Arm drag going for a headlock, but Jakari caught that. They resume with 22 now. 13-point lead for Mooresville as a team. Failed shot. Give Sanders a little credit here. He's, despite Oliver pretty much controlling this match, only down four. I think that you're dealing with some uh, some senior experience there. Uh, like what we were talking, he may be at the point that he's wondering, uh, I need one big move but I don't want to spread the score for the team exactly. either. If, you, if you're going to lose, well, might as well just keep it as a decision. I still think he's looking for one big move. I mean, you know, you've got a five-point throw, and all of a sudden this is a different match, and Jakari's on his back. I'll get the escape, make it 6-3. And now is Oliver looking to do something big here. As they get closer over here, so I'd like to remind them, this is expensive equipment, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was interesting that Jakari went into that over and under, uh, over and, under and that uh, Sanders didn't try to Metzger to keep him off of that. John, are there, would you say there are wrestlers that, while it looks like Oliver's been in control of this match for the first two periods, wrestlers maybe like a Sanders that would be waiting to make a move late if they can get to the third period. They wait, they feel them out that long, and then try to make a, a, a big move late. It could be. Uh, I don't know if these two have ever met before or seen each other before because it might be one of those things that Sanders is thinking, I've got to keep this match close and then uh, set up for one big move. Uh, that's what I was talking about, grinders. I want to keep it close and low because I think I have better technique and I can catch him. But right now is a real tough time in a match whenever you're in these upper weights because your body is just burning, your lungs are heavy, and you're, you know that you have to muster an explosive, powerful move and whether I've got enough left in the tank to do it or not. We're going to find out right here. Oliver just trying to hold on for three more seconds. And that will end the match. Oliver... Gets the decision, 6-3. Brings us Whiteland Warriors back within 10 for the match. Now to our top weight class, 285, Davis Hall versus Connor Davis. Hall for the a Pioneers, senior. a senior, and Davis the junior. Heavyweight is always an interesting class because uh, it, Heavyweights are very intelligent because they are able to capitalize on their strengths. And because you're dealing with big linemen from football, every one of them has a different strength. Some can squat a Toyota. Some can bench press a house. And uh, they have different centers of balance. One thing, too, you mentioned, and it just comes to mind, as a lineman, what's the one thing you use a lot in football? Your hands. Got to be good with your hands in football, and you'd think that would translate well over to wrestling as well. Quick hands, good hand-eye coordination, but it is also, like you said, just a lot of brute force out there. Yeah, and what they'll do is is they'll hand fight for inside control. 
Now, if you ever end up in a David and Goliath type of um, heavyweight match, you don't want to be going head-to-head. But both of these guys are used to being in the trenches and going nose-to-nose. You know, you mentioned, too, about the end of that 220 weight class matchup, just how much the lungs burn. And when I was back in high school, I was doing a, uh, a little series called Quarterly Conquers where I would go around to the different athletes at the school and we'd take on a different challenge, and one of them was wrestling. And we just did uh, three minute, one three-minute round, just no clock stoppage. And let me tell you, if you want a good workout, forget about signing up for that gym membership here in the new year. Just find yourself a wrestling partner, wrestle for about maybe 10 minutes a day, and you will be worn out. I, I was out of breath, and I said, I'm 18 years old. How am I this out of shape? And wrestlers, they're just built differently. The conditioning is year-round for the most part. For those that play a separate sport, that is their conditioning. But, again, wrestlers just built differently. Well, and, you know, it's one of those things when your body is the entire sport. Oh, exactly. It is what I like to call a pure sport. And there are other pure sports, um, track, cross country, swimming. But, you know, you have trained your body in a median. And that's the amazing thing. You will work out all week for one six-minute match. Second period, no score there in the first. Apologize for the graphic there, but we are in the second period. And they'll start from the neutral position here. Connor Davis had choice. Both men, very powerful legs and really good balance. When you start from the neutral position, is it maybe an uncertainty of knowing, do I have enough strength to get out, and does he have enough strength to get out if I start on top, or is it more just still wanting to feel out the opposing wrestler. You've got two large, powerful individuals, and you've got to imagine, I have to get me up with an explosive, plus I have a person who is 285 pounds on my back as well. And so uh, unless you are very quick on bottom, you don't want a heavyweight to uh, begin to situate their weight on you uh, because that's one of their techniques is I'm going to use my weight and your weight to wear you down. Because imagine, even if you're in that parterre position and you're staying up on your knees, your arms are bearing both men's weight. 54 seconds left here in period number two. And it looked like there was a point there given to a Davis Hall. Didn't catch that point. Hall may have uh, had choice chosen down, and uh, Connor decided, I'm I'm not even going to go there. Let, gotcha. Let's go neutral. Eighteen seconds left now. Hall was doing a snap down technique, but he wasn't following it up with uh, any type of secondary move. Connor's doing a nice job of not overreacting to the snap down. Sometimes a wrestler will pull way back, and there's where you open up for the takedown. Connor Davis will start down. Davis hope- Hall will go ahead and elect to start on top here rather than go up to the neutral like. Connor Davis did. Yeah, it does look like, um, you know, I hope that Connor has a strategy and he has his move already selected and knows where uh, he wants Hall to be whenever he initiates his move. Connor's doing a nice job of building his base. Now, right now, uh, Hall isn't going to do a whole lot that might endanger himself because he's riding the hips pretty heavy. And even just an escape here ties up this match.
these are those times that conditioning becomes very important. 56 seconds left, third period. connor has got to start slow and rebuild that base. 285 weight class. Mooresville has won the last three individual matches. Two pins. Or excuse me, two of the last three. Oh. Hall sunk the half, got it in, took his time. He'll get the pin. Brings our team score to 34-18. And other than Jakari Oliver in the 220 weight class, it's been three pins in the last four weight classes for Mooresville. It's uh, going to be a forfeit for Whiteland in the 106, which will give Mooresville another 40. Go all the way back up now to 113, where it'll be Griffin Sanders, the freshman, versus Joey Butler, the sophomore. Tyler Miller was the winner for Mooresville there by uh, uh, forfeit. So now the uh, match is, is pretty much out of range. And this is where, if you are the tail end of this. Nice move right there by Joey Butler. It's a little bit nicer, I guess, as an individual wrestler because you can wrestle for yourself at this point. Of course, you care what the team does, but Butler not going to have that pressure. He was the 113 sectional runner-up last year. Stays in that same weight class. Joey's one that's really conscientious about his weight and watching his diet and, uh, you know, trying to do it the right way. Sanders gets up and gets the escape. And Butler goes right back to work. That was just a snatch single, and it was so quick that uh, Sanders didn't even have a chance to react. Now, I typically wouldn't say necessarily a sophomore versus a freshman is a wide gap in experience, but when you do talk about having success in a sectional format, as just a freshman, then coming back this year, your second year, that's got to give you some confidence, I'd say, heading into your second season. Well, you don't understand that uh, sectionals are different, okay? And the the mid-states, Johnson County, Marion County, uh, there's tough wrestling. And to qualify for regional out of the Mooresville sectional is a feat. And you've had to earn it uh, because there are some tough teams. I have seen wrestlers who have wrestled four years that have never made it out of that sectional just because of where they are. I have seen wrestlers who could have been uh, a champion or a runner-up in another sectional that uh, become fifth place at Mooresville. I think, too, it depends. You know, it's, I'm sure before the season starts, the, the coaches, the player, the wrestlers, they have those conversations, and it's who here wants to be a sectional champion, but then it's who wants to work for it. And that's what separates, again, the, the ones that are the great ones from those that will be good or average wrestlers. And you got to have to want to work for it, too. And it starts not when the season starts. It starts well before that. And like you said, dieting, uh, all those different aspects that go into being a good wrestler, uh, it starts well before the first day of practice. Well, and the thing of it is, is, is that concept of a champion, uh, every aspect about you needs to be a champion. A champion's not a winner. A winner somebody can win a lot of matches. A champion is someone that that's their life. They're a champion in the classroom. They're a champion with their parents. They're a champion on the mat. And um, I used to always tell my wrestlers, you know, if you want to see yourself on that podium, you have to first be able to truly close your eyes and visualize it. Then you ask yourself, what am I going to do to make this a reality? Butler gets the escape here in period number two. Joey's just got way too oh, much nice technique. Move. Throws him to his back. Very close to getting the fall here. We've got a... So they're going to give him the near fall, and then it looked like an illegal hold for a point for yes, it was Griffin down on Sanders. it was down on the leg, which is kind of a freestyle move because in freestyle you can tilt off of that. In folk style, school style wrestling, um, 
there's a lot more caution to safety. So that's why that's an illegal move at this level. That particular move was called a uh, Gable Turk. Butler with another two. Sanders got the escape moments ago. 14-4 here in the second period with a minute 11 left to go. Tell you what, Butler doing a lot of scoring here. And you talked about those that are scores. I believe Butler might be one that would classify. He's got a lot of really good techniques. And you can tell that he's been on the mat for a long time. He's gotten a lot of mat time uh, and seen a lot of different experiences. Uh, what I like is, is that Joey can anticipate, throw to the back, Got him close here. And there it is. I think to a lot of extent, Joey knew that he could uh, pretty much find a combination that was going to result in the pin. So the fall, Butler gets Whiteland another six points, 40-24 Team match score. Looks like uh, there's going to be a late forfeit as Aiden O'Brien will not be wrestling. So uh, forfeit gives Whiteland another six here. And our last match of the night, we go to the 126 weight class where it will be Isaiah Pugh, a senior captain, versus Jaden Wiseman, a freshman for Whiteland. So, yes, indeed, the team match out of reach for Whiteland. Pew last year, we talked about the sectionals, a runner-up in 120. He's moved up a weight class this year. That's a nice combination, but what I will tell you is, is Jaden did a nice job to not put himself in jeopardy, but uh, Pew followed up with a nice combination. That's somebody who's thinking ahead to the pinning combination. Wiseman trying to get to that escape. He does get himself temporarily out of jeopardy, but he also has the arm trapped. Near fall for Pugh. Gets him another 3-5-0 under a minute left in the first period. What I've got to say is, is it looks like Jaden is not afraid of the senior captain in Pugh. Uh, I mean, he's really working to try some things. Um... And you can tell that Pew really has a wealth of knowledge of uh, the moves that he's wanting to do. Oh, he tied him up tight there, and he's got a Turk. And there's the pin. And that will end the match. So the final score, Mooresville 46, Whiteland 30. John, anything that you learned today about Whiteland and what you liked out of some of the wrestlers or any matches that stuck out to you? Uh, well, I can tell you one of the things is uh, you, you're seeing more experience versus youth. We've got some holes in our lineup, but there's a lot of promise there. I saw a lot of uh, a decent wrestling. Uh, in some cases, uh, it was just mismatches in the lineup. Well, Coach Meister said before the season, quote, we didn't lose any kids and we gained some, so I'll, we're going to build on what we accomplished last season. Uh, I think they, they did their, they're in the right direction doing that. They're going to build on what they had last season. Like you said, a lot of young wrestlers out there. So, again, final score, Mooresville 46, Whiteland 30. Dr. Shalosky, you told us that you've done a little bit of everything, but you hadn't yet broadcasted a, a wrestling match. So uh, welcome to, I think you've made it to the Golden Club, if you will, for wrestling. You've, you've coached, you've wrestled, you said you've officiated, uh, so, and you've PA'd announced for all these, and now you're, you can check off the broadcasting from the list. So thank you so much for being here. This was a lot of fun, and I hope that uh, we can do this again. Uh, I really enjoy that uh, the Warrior Beat Nation is uh, giving credit to a lot of different uh, – sports and giving them that opportunity because uh, to each uh, athlete in their individual sport it's just as important as that Friday night lights Absolutely. or under the the hoops um, that 
long ball home run. Uh, it's what their interest is in. And that's what I think is really special about uh, IHSAA athletics is that they try to provide an opportunity for kids to shine at what they're good at and what they're interested in.